Thanks to the organizers for having invited me today. Thanks so much, Vijay. And thanks, No Waters, for sponsoring this session. Uh, so my topic is uh, targeted treatment, uh, which is specific to BRAF and MET. Well, we have all these drugs available now. And well, it's definitely wonderful times. And this is, I think, our favorite uh, slide when we have a lung session. So there are about 2.2 million new cases across the globe. Uh, lung cancer being the second most common cancer and the first most common cause of death. And what we basically need to know is that 87% of all lung adeno, uh, carcinomas would have some potentially actionable driver mutation. And this is the interesting area which the entire session today is all about. So uh, what, what do we have? Well, almost 3% of the patient would have a mex, uh, met exon 14 skipping mutation. 2.5% uh, may have MET amplification and almost 5.5% would have BRAF mutation. So these are the three things I would be talking on. And well, uh, Vamsi very uh, nicely illustrated that what is the importance of next-gen sequencing. And yes, we all tend to do larger panels now, at least a 12 or 15 uh, uh, mutation panel and higher panel if necessary. And definitely the advantage is smaller tissue with uh, faster results and low input of DNA high sensitivity and specificity, and multiple possibilities. So this is the uh, coupon of Novartis, which Vamsi was speaking about, in which we have results about DNA sequencing and also RNA sequencing. And we have interest here because we are talking about MET uh, with DNA sequencing and BRAF with DNA sequencing. And of course, MET exon uh, 14 skipping mutation with RNA sequencing. So let me start with BRAF V600E uh, mutation which is called as the typical BRAF uh, mutation. And well, uh, this we all know that BRAF is a serine threonine kinase belonging to the RAS-RAF MEK pathway. And what it basically does is in tumor cell, uh, the BRAF mutations lead to constitutive activation uh, in the absence of growth factor signaling. BRAF V600E, which I said is the typical BRAF, is the most common activating mutation in cancers. And very commonly we see in melanomas, uh, we see in papillary thyroid cancers, uh, colorectal cancer, and now of course NSCLC, in which almost 5% would have this. Just the V600E is 5%, but if we put BRAF together, it is much higher. So it's a point mutation in the exon 15 of the BRAF gene, where adenine is replaced by thymine. This is actually a very uh, nice slide in which uh, all, there is a data which we have from China, United States, and Europe, in which they have said that uh, in Europe, almost 5% prevalence of BRAF is noted. And US has uh, the SEER data, which says almost 3% prevalence of BRAF, and China has about 1.7% prevalence. And the outcomes also have been reported, which I'll discuss further. So Chinese data uh, with BRAF mutated specific uh, NSCLC had shown that chemotherapy, the disease control rate was around 79% when pemetrexate was given. When paclitaxel was used as a chemotherapy partner, almost 40% disease control rate, which is almost half of pemetrexate. When vimurafenib, debrafenib, or debrafenib along with trimetinib was given, there was a 100% disease control rate. So this is the remarkable thing which uh, we need to focus on. And in the US BRAF study group, when a targeted therapy was used, overall survival was in the tune of 56 months. I mean, this is remarkable. And then when no targeted therapy was used, the overall survival was in the tune of 27 months, which we normally see. So why do we use the two agent and not single agent? So debrafenib is an inhibitor of some of the mutated forms of BRAF, including BRAF uh, V600E, uh, as well as the wild type BRAF and the CRAF. Trimetinib is a reversible inhibitor of MEK1 and MEK2. And this prevents the activation and kinase uh, activity and works in the down-regulation pathway. When we uh, bind BRAF and MEK inhibitors in the targeted uh, sequence, uh, we know that they act at different level and therefore are involved in oncogenic signaling and causing cell cycle errors. What we know is this, when debrafenib is given as a single therapy, like only a monotherapy, it leads to actually a paradoxical activation of the downstream, uh, downstream effectors and therefore actually can lead to tumor progression. And that's probably the reason tr uh, trimetinib should be added in all cases and not uh, debrafenib alone is not recommended. So this was the landmark study. And this was also the study which led to FDA approval. Although it was a very small study, 
And the background of the study was that there were three cohorts and the cohort A, which established the role of uh, BRAF was a phase two uh, uh, BRF 113928. The study design was three cohorts and the first cohort had 60 patients in stage one, stage two, and then expansion cohort in which all uh, good performance status, that is zero, one, and two were used with who had already been treated with platinum therapy. So they were given only debrafenib, that is 150 milligram twice a day, and which was an escalation arm. The uh, cohort B, which had 40 patients, which actually established the use of debrafenib along with trimetinib, was again patients who had one to three prior lines of therapy and at least one line of platinum-based therapy in which debrafenib was given as 150 milligram twice a day, and trimetinib was given as two milligram once a day. So this was again a dose escalation arm in which stage one had 20 cases, stage two had again 20 cases and overall 57 cases were used. So uh, uh, patient demographics and characteristics were matched. Uh, most of the patients were more than 60 years, uh, median age being 64. The most common metastatic site was lymph node and in the treatment naive patient and also in the pre-treated cases. The treatment included chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and also biologic therapy. So what happened in the debrafenib, trimetinib arm, uh, who had been pre-treated and who were treatment naive? In both the cases, the overall response rate was 69% in the pre-treated arm and 64% in the treatment naive arm. The median duration of response was about 10 months in both the arms, that is 9.8 months and 10.2 months. The median progression free survival was also very similar in both the arms, that is 10.2 months and 10.8 months. And the median overall survival was 18.2 months and 17.3 months. All these results were very poor in the debrafenib monotherapy arm, that is the single uh, agent arm in cohort A. This led to uh, uh, basically incorporating uh, debrafenib in the NCCN and the ESMO guidelines. And now in the first line setting, we could either give debrafenib along with trimetinib or Vimbrafenib in certain circumstances as for both NCCN and ESMO. And as I stated that this was the sum uh, with the data cutoff being June of 2019. So we have these results for almost two years now with the overall response rate in the combination arm of 68%, the median progression free survival of 10.2 months, me median overall survival of one and a half year, that is 18.2 months. And this led to uh, the gr uh, granting of permission on June 22nd, uh, 2017. But the final results were published in 2019 uh, in Annals of Oncology. So next I'll be treating, uh, talking about Kepmatinib, which has been recently introduced by Novartis in the market, uh, which acts on MET, MET exon 14 mutation. So what exactly is the MET oncogenic driver? Well, when we talk about its practical application, it, we could be talking about uh, MET kinase domain mutation, it could be MET amplification, it could be MET fusions, or it could be skipping mutation. So all of this requires a wider panel, a good uh, sequencing method in which you could do RT-PCR and genomic sequencing or a whole exome sequencing or preferably a hybrid capture NGS. And according to FDA, the approved panel is foundation one. And what are the clinical characteristics of uh, metexon 14 uh, NSCLC? Well, uh, they are seen in almost 3% of all NSCLC, more common in female population than in males, uh, which is very similar to most of the other specific uh, biomarkers as well. The median age of presentation is 72.5 years, which is significantly higher than the average age of lung cancer presentation. Uh, we also note that most of the histology is adenocarcinoma. Uh, there's no clear association of smoking history. And uh, it definitely presents with more aggressive uh, disease and also aggressive histologies. And most commonly, as we see in clinical practice, sarcomatoid features will be seen in most of uh, these patients. BRAF mutation will have micropapillary features on pathology. So this was the results we had until uh, the approval of Kepmatinib that if we had uh, met, uh, met exon 14 skipping mutation, it was associated with worse prognosis. And as you can see uh, that uh, in the second kaplan meyer curve, a uh, wild uh, type which did not have met had a significant survival advantage versus the patient who had met skipping mutation. And this happened when uh, targeted therapy was introduced in stage four cases, uh, which was met specific. 
And until now, what we had was prisotinib and cabozantinib, but now we have kipmatinib. And as soon as the drug changed from chemotherapy uh, to targeted therapy, the median overall survival improved from 8.1 months to 24.6 months. This was again a remarkable increase. And uh, this was the comparison which was there when we had prisotinib as the only non-specific uh, met uh, targeted drug. In this uh, study as well, when prisotinib was given, the overall response rate was in the tune of 32 uh, percentage, which was less, but almost double as compared to chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And we have now almost, uh, we have almost finished one and a half or probably more than that years uh, with kepmatinib available. And still, I mean, uh, it took a while to have it in our country. So what exactly is kepmatinib? It's a highly selective MET inhibitor. ATP competitive, highly potent, reversible inhibitor of MET. The other inhibitors available are kepmatinib. Uh, besides kepmatinib is savolitinib, uh, tipotinib, which we don't have uh, until now, but commonly used in Japan and Korea. And of course, we have cabozantinib as well, which has again come in market only in the past three and a half, four months. And then chrysotinib, which we all were using all this while when we had a MET uh, drug. So as Vamshi said, uh, the complex study designs which we have, and this is just the right example of that. Geometry uh, Mono 1 was a phase 2 study design with actually not a very large number of patients. It had 373 patients with 7 cohorts. Actually 8 cohort because one cohort had 2 parts in it. And all the patients more than 18 years of age of any histology, whether it was uh, adenocarcinoma, sarcomatoid type, or it was squamous cell carcinoma, who were EGFR and ALK wild type and had met dysregulation by central pathology in good performance status with one measurable disease at least. And the drug dose was 400 milligram given twice a day. Again, there were two arms uh, with given in FET state or not, not uh, FET state. This was a multi-cohort arm, but uh, two stratification criteria was whether previous treatment was given or not, or whether it was met dysregulation uh, versus uh, met mutations. So uh, these were the results in which uh, we, I'll talk about treatment naive patients and treatment pre, uh, pre, uh, sorry, pre-treated cases. So cohort four and cohort six was the arm of pre-treated cases. And most of the patient had received at least one line of platinum containing chemotherapy. Some had received second line and third line chemotherapy as well. And what were the results? Uh, when a treatment naive uh, cohort was taken, that is 5B and 7, uh, the overall response rate was 68%. The median progression-free survival was 12.4 months. The median overall survival was 20.8 months. And the uh, median uh, duration of response was 12 months. So this was much better as compared to chemotherapy alone when the ORR was only about 17%. So 17% became 68%. And of course, the PFS and o, uh, OS also improved. When pre-treated cohorts were taken, that is 4 and 6, the ORR was 40% with a disease control rate of about 78%. So in summary, uh, Geometry Mono 1 uh, was a uh, kepmatinib trial with 400 mg twice a day with about 373 patients. The stratification arm were met exon 14 mutated versus met amplified arm. Uh, the primary endpoint was uh, ORR. So in met skipping mutation, which are actually the specific mutations for uh, kepmatinib, in treatment naive patient, the ORR was about 68%, with the median duration of response about 12.6 months. In the pre-treated arm, the overall response rate was around 40%, and the median duration of response was 9.7%. Now, the second part is actually alarming. Uh, met amplification with less copy numbers, that is when the copy number were less than 10, the response rate was only about 10%, which was 70% in skipping mutation arm. And when the um, uh, amplification copy number was greater than 10, the overall response rate was 30% uh, in pre-treated cases and 40% in treatment naiva. So uh, also we need to know that it has very high activity in brain metastasis. In this study, only 13 patients had evaluable brain meds. Hello, ma'am. You have one minute to conclude your talk, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And we found that intracranial responses were as fast as the extracranial responses. The most common side effect noted was peripheral edema, which was seen in around 43% of patients. 
And besides GI side effect like nausea and vomiting, which was seen in about 35% patients. So in summary, we know that this is a, a very specific, highly specific drug for NSCLC expressing MET exon 14 with good intracranial and extracranial responses with very manageable side effect profile. With this, I end my talk. Thanks so much.